Jesus, my Lord, my pleasing scene is clouded o'er with pain. My gloomy fears rise dark between, and I again complain. Oh, and I again complain. Jesus, my Lord, my life, my light, oh, come with blissful rain. Bake radiant through the shades of night and chase my fears away. Won't you chase my fears away? Then shall my soul with rapture trace the wonders of thy love but the full glories of thy face are only known above they are only known above this, this week we had the um, funeral of one of my cousins and it was a it was, it was a good funeral. I know that's a weird thing to say, but it was actually a very encouraging funeral. And I think it's because I know this is a term y'all have had heard all your life is you actually preach your funeral while you're living, not during the funeral. And we find out that from a lot of people in a lot of different ways that the life that Doug lived influenced so many people in so such small ways and yet in such big ways. And I think that's what God has intended us and how, how we should live our lives is it's the daily things that you do that give him glory, whether they be something small or something that's bigger. Or I don't know how we categorize what we do for people. But it's those little things and the way that we reflect Christ to a lot of people that actually change a whole lot more people than you ever realize. So when, when we're living our lives daily and, and you, you're doing the little things that you do and, you know, that this is the thing I struggle with. Do I take the time to do this now or is it something I can do later? Take the time to do it now. And whether, uh, whatever it is, Lots of times that little thing that you wanted to do now that was so important to you will wait. It's the little things that you try to do for other people that seem to have a whole lot more value. Um, and I just want to encourage you to do that because th that is the living hope like we're going to sing about. That it's, it's praising God daily with our lives in the little things and the big things that actually matter. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my
example here in the Lord's Prayer that each time we read it, I hope and pray that it's something new, it's something that we can use in our daily lives. So let's join together as we have our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this prayer. Lord, we know that as you told the disciples to pray according to this, Lord, that you knew the needs that we would have today. So we ask, Lord, that we would reflect on this prayer often. 
Lord, that yours would be the kingdom and that you would receive the glory, not us. Lord, that you would humble us before you. Lord, you would help us to offer forgiveness. Lord, even when it's cost us, we ask that you would help us to show grace. Lord, to show kindness. To show love. We ask, Lord, that when temptation comes our way, Lord, that you would help us to run, to turn away. Lord, to quote the many verses that you have laid before us through your holy word. Lord, to ask for help. Lord, to get down on our knees and ask forgiveness. We ask that yours would be the kingdom here on earth. Lord, this, this is a short time for us. And when we know that the life we're living today, Lord, is just a practice for the heaven that you have promised us through the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, may your Holy Spirit do that work in us. Lord, may you be working in our lives. Lord, to give you praise and give you glory, not to ourselves. But we ask that you would be with our friends that have need. Lord, as we've heard in the announcement time, there's many that are hurting. There's many that have lost loved ones. Help us, Lord, to reach out in your name, to be your hands, your feet, to be the shoulder to cry on, to be a hand to help someone get up, to be there to listen, whatever form or fashion. And Lord, we ask that as we come before you this morning, as you have prepared a message through Andy, give us ears to hear. Use your Holy Spirit Lord, to do the work in our lives that we need. All this we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 9. As we continue <clears throat> our study of that chapter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Is the pollen count high this morning? I don't know. I woke up this morning, my voice was not totally there, and it just feels that way. So, <clears throat> um, so we're going to look at this. That we started this chapter last week. We're going to look at it this week and then in two weeks um, because there are themes in it. I mentioned this last week, themes in it that I think are really important for us to slow down and absorb. Uh, just to, to remind you of, of where we are, uh, this particular account happens between the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication. So it's sometime between September and December. It's happening uh, kind of in, in the, at the doorsteps, so, so to speak. It's, it's close by the synagogue. Um, we have this amazing thing that Jesus has done. He's healed a man who was born blind. No one had ever done this before. And so we talked about that last week, about the miracle that's there and how we need God's miraculous work in our lives to heal us from our spiritual blindness, because spiritual blindness is actually the dominant theme of this passage, and that we need Jesus' healing of spiritual blindness. And we're going to focus more on spiritual blindness this week, and then in two weeks, more about what does it mean to have spiritual sight, and what does that, what does that look like? And we'll see it... Um, as we focus more attention on the man who had been healed. Um, although, of course, in this passage, we'll see him today as well. So Jesus had healed the man born blind. And then, please stand and you'll find out what happens next. <laughs> we stand in honor of God who has given us his holy, inspired, inerrant word. Hear the word of the Lord beginning at John 9, verse 15. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. 
So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they again to the, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that, the, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Father, we pray that you would take this, your holy word, and make it sweeter than the drippings of a honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this account <clears throat> is a really sad testimony in many ways of how we hold on to traditions that keep us from seeing the truth. At a recent Presbytery meeting, I overheard, uh, or not overheard, a pastor was giving a report about his church, and he was talking about this young couple who were not believers. Uh, they were not married. They were living together. Um, as a result of, of him uh, teaching them the scriptures, they were coming to church, and they, they professed faith in Christ. It was this amazing moment where they saw their need for Jesus, and their eyes were open. And in fact, they were so struck by Jesus' teaching and the Bible's teaching about sexual faithfulness within marriage alone that one of them moved in with their parents and they set a wedding date. I mean, what a time to rejoice, right? And then the pastor frowned that after about two years, the couple decided to leave the church because they couldn't agree with a couple of particular theological beliefs that are unique to Presbyterians, or maybe not unique, but that are part of our Presbyterian beliefs, and that they were now in a Pentecostal charismatic church. And during a prayer time, one of the pastors prayed about their apostasy. I'll tell you, I wanted to scream, what in the world is going on here? Because we have a difference of opinion about theological perspectives, we're calling a brother and sister in Christ apostate? That means they reject the faith? 
And as quick as I was in that judgment, it opened my eyes to the ways that, that all of us are so quick to see God's work when it lines up with our theological positions. But when God does something outside of the box that we create, we have a really hard time giving glory to Him. It's like we blind ourselves to anything that God might do that doesn't fit into our increasingly narrow doctrinal box. The doctrinal box that's not about the gospel, but about our interpretations of things in the Bible. Jesus' miracle exposes exactly that kind of spiritual blindness. And it's really an amazing irony because there was a man who was born blind. There was nothing he could do but be blind. He couldn't do anything about it. And Jesus healed him. And then we have the contrast in the irony of the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the seminary professors, if you will, of the day, who refused to see who were willfully spiritually blind. They were a people that were hiding in their religious views that kept them from seeing what God was doing. This is spiritual blindness. And there's three things I'd like you to consider today about spiritual blindness that, we, that we'll use this passage to, to amplify one is the symptoms of spiritual blindness. The other is the look we need to take at ourselves and then the only cure for our spiritual blindness. So the symptoms of spiritual blindness, the look we need to take at ourselves, and the only cure for our spiritual blindness. The symptoms of spiritual blindness is actually what dominates the passage. And what we see is the Pharisees' response to Jesus. How are they handling what is going on here? And what we see is that the Pharisees are hanging on to their rigid traditions. In fact, their rigid traditions, and this is a symptom of spiritual blindness, is when our rigid traditions supersede or take the place of biblical faithfulness. You see, the Pharisees followed what was called the oral law the traditions, in, usually found in the Mishnah. And, and what the Mishnah was, the oral traditions were the teachings of rabbis over the centuries of interpretations of the Bible, particularly of God's law. And this is their main beef with Jesus. You'll notice that they didn't say, wow, this man was healed. The first thing they did was point out that he had violated their view of how to keep the Sabbath. That was their concern. It was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes, it says in verse 14. And so the Pharisees, as they're putting the questions and tightening the screws on this man born blind, they even asked him later on, well, how did he, excuse me, how did he heal you? They wanted to know, what did he do and why is that? Well, D.A. Carson points out that there were at least three things that Jesus had probably um, transgressed uh, as far as the oral law, the oral traditions were concerned. Um, at least two of them, but maybe three. One, uh, according to the tradition, healing was not allowed to happen on the Sabbath unless someone's life was in danger. So what the, that's not what the Bible says. That's what the teachings say, the rigid traditions. Another tradition that was passed down is that needing was prohibited. I don't mean like we need God. I mean needing, like kneading dough, okay? So think about it. How did Jesus heal you? He spit in the dirt. He kneaded mud and placed the mud on the man's eyes. And then the third, which was kind of up, there was some division about it, 
was whether or not you were allowed to anoint somebody's eyes on the Sabbath. Whatever the laws were, they were extra biblical. They were more than what the scriptures give as guidelines. And so we see that these Sabbath laws that went beyond the scripture were the rigid traditions that the Pharisees were consumed with. And for them to violate the oral law, the traditions, was to violate God's word. So symptom number one of spiritual blindness, when rigid traditions supersede or replace biblical faithfulness. The second symptom that we see is rigid traditions that turn into suspicion, domination, intimidation, and condemnation. I was trying to keep three points within this one point, so I'm just adding a whole bunch on this one, okay? But rigid tradition can, can turn into this suspicion, domination, intimidation, and condemnation, or we could say and or. It could be any of those or all of them. But the first one, religious or ri, ri, bleh, rigid traditions that, that turn into suspicion. Notice the rounds of interrogation. The Pharisees are like the Spanish Inquisition, okay, in this moment. They go to the man who was born blind, and they're trying, and we even saw this last week. They're trying to figure out, is this really a hoax or not? Was this guy really born blind, or is he just trying to hoodwink us? Or is Jesus maybe doing something to try to pretend like he did this, but it didn't really happen? That's what they're driving at in their questions. And so they, they end up going to the man's parents. That makes sense, right? I mean, if you're suspicious of, about something, you go to the source. Go to the parents. What do you say about him? Or excuse me, no, that was the wrong verse. <laughs> That's what they asked the man. And he said, he is a prophet. That's Jesus. They didn't believe him. So they called the parents and they asked them, is this your son who was born blind? Yes, it's our son. How does he now see? We're not sure. Why don't you ask him? He's of age. So we know that the man was at least 13 because that would be of age. He was probably older than that. He'd probably been there for a while. He was a beggar that everybody knew he was a beggar that had been there uh, and blind. They were suspicious. They wanted to uncover the lie. Inquiring minds want to know. Suspicion is not horrible, by the way. It's not bad to, to go down and trace out and investigate things. That's not a bad thing. But they wouldn't listen to the evidence when it was given. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you'll notice that during this inquisition, we see domination. That the religious leaders had created an environment of fear. When it says, by the way, the Jews here uh, in these verses, um, after it said the Pharisees and then it said the Jews uh, did this, it, it's talking about the religious leaders, okay? Maybe not just Pharisees, maybe some priests as well or scribes, but definitely the leaders. But notice in verse 27, after they said, you know, ask him, he's of age, he will speak for, him, for himself. I'm sorry, verse 22, I didn't see that clearly. Um, his parents said these things, because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Domination is where you create an environment of fear, and this environment of fear is based on the rigid traditions. There was a process in the Old Testament and in the New of investigation, of calling someone to repentance if there is a sin that's being seen as being committed, and then a process if there's no repentance for excommunication. That was thrown out the window. They said if anyone confesses that Jesus is the Christ, they're out of here. And so what were the parents afraid of? They were afraid of this dominating attitude that if they even gave an inkling that they thought Jesus had done this healing... They might be accused of confessing that Jesus is the Christ, even if they didn't really believe that and just thought that he was from God, and they'd be kicked out. 
It's an, it's an environment of fear. And when you hold to, re, to rigid tra- traditions that are not the Scripture, it's easy for that to be created. If you don't tow the party line on this or that, you're out of here. The third thing that we see that these rigid traditions can turn into is intimidation. And it may not look like it at first glance, but in verse 24, the sec- for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Now we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks, but the boldness of this healed man. We're beginning to really see it. But at first glance, when they say give glory to God, we would say, well, amen, give glory to God, right? This was a loaded statement. It was meant to intimidate this witness. You know, lawyers get in trouble for trying to lead or intimidate witnesses. At least they're supposed to. (laughs) They're trying to intimidate him. What are they really saying? Well, Carson says that they're really saying something like this. Before God, own up and admit the truth. In other words, we know you're lying about this guy. We know you're lying about this miracle. Give glory to God. In other words, own up to the truth and finally give glory to God, you liar. That's what they're meaning. They were so convinced that Jesus is a sinner. Remember, back in the previous chapter, Jesus actually had told the readers of the Gospel of John, remember, when they read it, they, weren't, they would read it as one whole. And if you read chapter 8, Jesus would say, try to accuse me of a sin. <laughs> see if you can find one. And now we see in John 9, the religious leaders are trying to. And he was violating their oral traditions, but not the law of God. But in this moment, they're trying to intimidate this man who had been healed to say that Jesus was a sinner and he couldn't do it. I don't know. I don't know if he is or not. This man didn't fully understand who Jesus was. Again, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. But notice how all of it culminates, too, when we see these rigid traditions that 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 have this environment of suspicion, this this environment of fear created by domination, and and then this intimidation, it leads to condemnation. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. No trial, really. Just condemnation. And that's so often what happens when we follow rigid traditions instead of the Scripture. But I think the saddest thing of all is the third symptom of spiritual blindness, and that's when our rigid traditions blind us from seeing God's work and giving glory to Him. I think the most damning irony of all of this in the passage is that when the Pharisees are demanding that this formerly blind man, give glory to God? They are not. There's a lot of irony, but this is a damning irony. This is the kind of irony that condemns. They refuse to see the work of God. They refuse to give glory to Him. And they also refuse to see something that's very clear in the Scripture. The last time I checked in Scripture that when Adam and Eve fell into sin as our representatives, guess what? All of us are born in utter sin. And what did they accuse the healed man of? You were born in utter sin and you would teach us and they cast him out. They weren't following the doctrine of the scriptures. They didn't see that they too were born in utter sin, and they may be getting this wrong. Craig Keener writes, this passage shows how much 
Their agenda of opposing Jesus colors their interest in truth. Evasively, they repeatedly ignore the testimony of the miracle itself. They begin with interest only in the Sabbath violation, ignore the healed man's own testimony, and intimidate his parents who already know the danger of disagreeing with what their inquisitors wish to hear. And then he goes on to describe how they violate the principles of a fair trial. But that's what rigid traditions do. They blind us from seeing God's work. The Pharisees couldn't see God's work. They wouldn't give glory to him because they were so caught up in traditions that were extra biblical. Now that brings us to our second point, the look that we need to take at ourselves. Now I'll tell you, when I'm reading this account... I read it like I'm the blind man. What I mean is, when we read these kinds of accounts, don't we say, yeah, blind man, stick it to him, right? I mean, and he has some dingers. I mean, it is amazing. The, the comebacks that he has, and they're not just comebacks. He really is driving the point home. It's kind of like when we hear the parable of the man with two sons, we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm that prodigal son that's been... In, and we don't see that actually sometimes we're the older brother who's very self-righteous. The look we need to, to take at ourselves is that we were spiritually blind too and we may be living in some measure of spiritual blindness now. Tim Keller, uh, I came across a quote on, on the Facebooks this week, um, I said that wrong intentionally, by the way. I do know it's Facebook. But I still don't have one of those instant grams. I really want to try one of those. I heard they're good. So, But Keller wrote, we, we are always the last one to see our self-absorption. There are two levels of spiritual blindness that I think we need to realize. And this is where we need to look at ourselves. One is just flat out spiritual blindness that keeps us from seeing God at all. That's the spiritual blindness that leads to eternal death and separation from Him. But there's another type of blindness, another type of spiritual blindness that keeps us from seeing God's grace at work. And that's something that we still struggle with. So I just have a couple of questions. One is, are you blinded from seeing God? I mean, this is the question every single one of us has to face because every one of us is born in utter sin. Every single one of us wants to see life through our own eyes. And we want to be the one who directs our own ship. We're the ones that want to... In our souls, we want to deny that God is at work. Whether it's by following some oral tradition like the Pharisees did, or some other religious tradition. All of us are religious at our core somehow. We believe something, even if we say we believe nothing. They couldn't see Jesus as the Christ. What is in your way? from seeing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God? Is it some rigid tradition that says something like, if I'm just really good, then that's going to matter for something at the end of my life? That God's going to look at that and say, you know what? Yeah, you did some bad things, but you did a lot of good things, and, and that's, that, that'll be good enough. The scriptures are clear. Even the very best things we do, if we do them on our own, they're filthy. They're disgusting before God. We need someone whose righteousness matters before God. And that's Jesus. He who never sinned, he knew no sin, became our sin so that by faith in him, 
we can be the righteousness of God. So are you blinded from seeing God? If you are, I pray that maybe today you'd see him. And if you want to talk about that, I'm here. Any of our elders would love to talk to you. In fact, any believer that's here would love to talk to you. I'm saying that, and you're like, uh, I'm nervous. Tell them who Jesus is to you. The second question, is your vision clouded by religious, or by, excuse me, rigid tradition so that you can't see God's grace at work? Is your vision clouded by rigid tradition so much that you can't see God's grace at work? What tradition or doctrine do you make central to the gospel that is not central? Let's talk about tradition for a minute. What do I mean by that? Well, in this case, I'm using it a little different than how I used it earlier. I just mean traditions because there is this merging of American culture and Christianity in such a way that we have a lot of traditions that we merge with biblical Christianity as if they're the same. An example. What would happen, and would you be bothered, if we didn't mention Mother's Day, <gasps> Father's Day, no, you don't care about that, <laughs> Veterans Day, Memorial Day, the 4th of July. What if we never mention that in a service? How would that just get you all, I don't know, I want to use a southern term and I'm not southern. I want to say hankered up, but that, that sounds southern, but I don't even know what it means. <laughs> How would that get you worked up? Well, I can't believe that they didn't mention this and that. Do the scriptures teach us to honor our mothers and fathers? Yes, and not just one Sunday a year that was created about 100 years ago. Does God want us to pray for our leaders? I think some who would get upset that we don't mention Veterans Day or Memorial Day need to consider how they post things on Facebook and other places about the current president, whoever he or she may be. We're to honor our leaders, respect our leaders. We may not respect all their decisions. We may not respect their choices. But we're called to pray for our leaders. God has put us where we are in the world. I'm getting into meddling, aren't I? What about the Christian flag? Well, that should be up here, and so should the American flag. The Christian flag was invented at the turn of the last century by a Sunday school teacher. In the scope of church history, the Christian flag is like a day old. And yet we hold it as if Jesus himself made it and carried it through. And it was hanging on the cross as he went up to Golgotha. That's kind of the way we do things. There's nothing in the scriptures that say, we must mention Mother's Day, Father's Day, Veterans Day, have a Christian flag. These are traditions that we merge with Christianity. And if they're not done or mentioned, we get, I'll use that term that I just made up, and you can use it for all hankered up. You can now use that. But what about doctrines? What about doctrines, interpretations of Scripture that we hold that if you don't have that same doctrinal perspective, then you're probably not really saved? I'm not talking about, by the way, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, holding high the Scriptures. I'm not talking about key doctrines that must be believed and held in order to be a believer. I'm talking about doctrines like the length of creation days, your views on the end times, Modes and methods and purposes of baptism. Views about charismatic gifts. Views about how predestination and free will work together. We have to take a look at ourselves. Is our vision clouded by rigid traditions 
to keep us from seeing God's grace at work? Is it important for us to wrestle through the scriptures and, and have views on these different things? Yes, but nobody has to be an expert on everything. I had an interesting conversation with my brother when we were in Ohio a few weeks ago. Actually, it was a brief conversation. I knew it would be because we both have the same perspective. He's a Pentecostal pastor. And he said, just make sure you tell everybody it's Pentecostal light. We're not that exciting. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> fine. But I know many of you have asked, what is it like? You know, what kind of conversations do you get into about theology? Well, we, we don't. We know we have differences of opinion, but that's not center in our relationship. Why should it be? Because what's central is who Jesus is. But so often we can allow our rigid traditions to take the place, the center stage, that if you don't have a particular doctrinal view on something, let's pick on the length of creation days, and you merge it with the centrality of the gospel, then what you're saying is, if you believe X, Y, or Z about creation days, then you are really a Christian. And if you don't, then you're, you're probably a heretic. And what is a heretic? Someone who denies Jesus. All of us have that temptation to be right. We are in a culture that's dominated by the need or the feeling of being right. And that certainly influences all of us to some degree. We are called to offer good judgments, to wrestle with the Scripture. But what I'm talking about is when we allow doctrinal perspectives about the Scriptures to get in the way of seeing God's grace at work in people's lives. I was and I still am angered that we were praying like that young couple who, who now knows Jesus for apostate because they're going to a charismatic church. Does that mean my brother is not a Christian? No. I want to use stronger language than that. J.C. Ryle writes, there is far more hope about him who says... I am a poor blind sinner and want God to teach me than about him who is ever saying, I know it, I know it, I'm not ignorant, and yet cleaves to his sins. The sin of that man remains. Third point, the only cure for our spiritual blindness. This is the Sunday school answer. What is the only cure for our spiritual blindness class? Jesus. 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 And what is it about Jesus? How does he cure our spiritual blindness? He says it in John 8. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus' cure does mean that we live in response. And how do we live in response to Jesus' cure? Well, we live in the humility of Jesus. Paul in Colossians 2. <clears throat> Can you pull that up, Kevin? Thank you. You were already on it. He writes, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What does Paul say? He, he's, he's saying, he, he talks in chapter 1 about what Jesus has done for us, and then he says, you want to know how to live? When he says walk in him, he's saying live in Jesus. Do you know how to live in Jesus? Live in him the same way you received him. How did we receive Jesus? By repenting of our sins and, and clinging to him by faith. It's in utter humility. So how are we to live in him? How are we to walk in him? By repenting of our sins and clinging to him in humility. And as we cling to him, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, we guard our hearts against the symptoms of spiritual blindness. The reason that I call them symptoms of spiritual blindness is because all of us are going to struggle with these things from time to time. 
all of us. And so we have to guard our hearts against these rigid traditions that supersede biblical faithfulness, these rigid traditions that turn into suspicion, domination, condemnation, and intimidation, these rigid traditions that blind us from seeing God's work and giving glory to Him. And so instead of being blinded to His work, we should look for God's work and give Him glory for it. But we don't do so blindly. There was nothing wrong initially with the religious leader saying, hey, what's going on here? There was nothing wrong with opening an investigation. I mean, come on. This is amazing. A man who was born blind being healed? We would have asked questions. The problem is they didn't listen to the answers. They had to hold on to their rigid traditions. God's work didn't fit within their box. The scriptures tell us not to just blindly buy into everything, but to search the scriptures Measure what goes on with the word that J.C. Ryle wrote. The state of mind we should always desire to possess is that of the noble-minded Bereans. When they first heard the apostle Paul preach, they listened with attention. They received the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures and compared what they heard with God's word. Happy are those who go and do likewise. I remember, um, I've shared this story before, but I went to Taylor University and I grew up in a uh, very, um, it was a church very much like Walnut Hill. It was Baptist, but it was very much like Walnut Hill. And uh, it was a good place, good place to learn the Bible. And there were still some things that were pretty, you know, we held some pretty strong doctrinal beliefs. And, uh, and one of them happened to be, uh, <laughs> I don't mean to be, just emphasizing this today, but just happens to be here. One of these things was the charismatic gifts died with the last apostle. So uh, my freshman year, first morning, okay, I, I had a roommate, John Filka from Indianapolis area. Um, I woke up, because I was sleeping and I was tired. I woke up to him praying in tongues. My heart started firing. All these doctrinal positions, spiritual gifts, he must have a demon, he must have this, he must that, he's, he's lying to himself, what is going on here? What is, all this stuff was firing up in my heart, in my head, the condemnation. And it wasn't until a few months later that it hit me. I was sleeping in and he was spending time with Jesus. This passage speaks to our blindness. I hope and pray that you're not truly spiritually blind, that you do know Jesus. But even those who know Jesus struggle with blindness. The good news is the Holy Spirit is ever at work working by and with his word to heal us of this blindness, to help us to see Jesus more clearly. And oh, what a day it will be when we see Jesus face to face and we'll no longer be blind. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts. Show us the areas where we're blind Convict us, even though we may be the last to see it. I pray that we wouldn't hide behind excuses or traditions or maybe even certain doctrines to keep from seeing your work. But use your spirit and your word to continue to give us sight. In Jesus' name. Please stand. The praise team is going to come forward.
bondage, sorrow, and night. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my wanting and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. my shameful failure and loss. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of our sorrows into thy balm, out of my storms and into thy calm. Out of distress into jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide jesus i come to thee out of myself to dwell in thy love out of despair into raptures of love upward forever on wings like a dove jesus i come to thee To the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold, Jesus, I come to thee. sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold, Jesus, I come to thee. Now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in his peace.